warm welcome from the Ashang Desai Center for Leadership and Organization Development at IIM Ahmedabad. I am Vishal Gupta, the chairperson for the Center for Leadership, and I'm joined by my colleague, Professor Kirti Sharda, who is a faculty and also a member at the Ashang Desai Center for Leadership and Organization Development. We very warmly welcome you all from whichever part of the world that you are joining us today to this IAMA Leadership Lecture Series. And it is a moment of great pride for all of us that we have with us today the eminent coach and business thinker, Dr. Marshall Goldsmith, who would be with us for this leadership lecture and would get uh, into a very open, frank, informal conversation with us on various aspects of leadership, coaching, and his experiences with business professionals. Before we go forward, I am sure Dr. Marsh, Marshall Goldsmith does not need an introduction, but I would still want to introduce him to the audience. Dr. Marshall Goldsmith is the member of Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame. He is the only two-time number one leadership thinker in the world. He has been number one executive coach and number one business thinker for eight consecutive years. He is author of three New York Times best-selling books. I am sure many of you would have read those books, his books as on date have sold more than 3 million copies around the world. It is a great pleasure and honor to have him. He is a PhD from UCLA and is a pioneer of 360 degree feedback as a leadership development tool. And his efforts in providing feedback and then following up with executives to measure changes in behaviors were precursors to what eventually evolved as the field of executive coaching. With more than 40 years of hands-on experience, Marshall Goldsmith is the leading expert on leadership and coaching for behavioral change. It is a pleasure our, our gratitude and our uh, thanks to Dr. Goldsmith. Thank you, Marshall, for joining us today for this conversation. And we will start with the theme of this talk. This conversation is 21st century leadership. And we would request Dr. Goldsmith to make quick, make a few opening remarks, and then we would, we would have this conversation. Marshall, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can, absolutely. Let me briefly introduce myself. I'm going to give about 15 minutes of just a brief dialogue. Then we're gonna open everything up for questions. Please be thinking of questions as I speak that you might like to ask, number one. And number two, in thinking of questions, I only answer questions where I'm an expert. So I don't want questions about politics or COVID or India or different generations. My area of expertise is helping very successful leaders achieve positive long-term change in their behavior. I'm also a Buddhist. So any questions about Buddhism, about life, a philosophy that I could possibly try to answer, I will. Uh, one thing I teach is something called feed forward. And please take this whole talk in that spirit. Feed forward is you ask for ideas, people give you ideas. You listen, you thank them. You don't have to do them all. So just take what I say in the spirit to which it's given. If I can help you have a little bit better life, that's wonderful. So that's my goal. Let, let's talk about a little bit of background. I'm from a small town called Valley Station, Kentucky. I went to a small engineering school, got an undergraduate degree in math and economics, got an MBA at Indiana, a PhD at UCLA. I was a college professor in Dean when I was very, very young. Then for 45 years, I've traveled all about the world doing one thing, uh, speaking and teaching. And I love that. I've been to 102 countries. I've been to India, I'm guessing 40 or 50 times. So I love working in India. It's my favorite place in the world to work. I miss working in India. 
I haven't been there since COVID, so it's been about two and a half years. So I would love to come back and visit again. So I hope I get to. So I love speaking and teaching and traveling about the world. Uh, the second thing I do is coach people. I've been the coach of the CEO of Ford, Pfizer, Glaxo, World Bank, Mayo Clinic, a Walmart, on and on and on. And what I love about coaching is coaching is where I learn everything. In theory, I'm supposed to teach these people. In practice, I always learn far more from these people than they ever learned from me. So what I love about coaching is not teaching, it's learning. And then finally, I write and edit books and articles. And was mentioned, I have, I think I've done now 47 books. It was mentioned, I have three big bestsellers. About 40 of the books were purchased only by my mother, my father, and relatives. So <laughs> I've done a lot of books. A few people bought, uh, uh, most of the books bought almost no copies, but three or four of the books, a lot of people bought those. So I've got a very, very wonderful life. I've been married 47 years. My wife, Lida, is a psychologist. Uh, my daughter, Kelly, is a professor at Vanderbilt here in Nashville. So that's where I live right now, Nashville, Tennessee. Two grandkids. My son's an entrepreneur. And here in Nashville, if you know about American music, I have a famous country music neighbors. Keith Urban, a famous country star, lives right down the street. His wife is Nicole Kidman. And then across the street is Taylor Swift. So I'm sure some of you have probably heard, from her, heard about her before. So life is good. Life is good. Now, let me just share a few thoughts for 15 minutes. And then we're going to have a dialogue. Thought number one, Peter Drucker is the greatest thinker in management history. Now, I may have been ranked number one leadership thinker in the world. My intellect compared to Peter Drucker is that of a 10-year-old. He was so smart. He taught me so many things, such a great mentor, such a great, a great thinker. One of the thoughts he gave me is this. He said, you know, the leader of the past knew how to tell. The leader of the future will know how to ask. The leader of the past knew how to tell. The leader of the future will know how to ask. Why? Today, the people I coach manage people called knowledge workers. What is the definition of a knowledge worker? They know more about what they're doing than their boss does. They know more about what they're doing than their boss does. If you're going to go into management today, you're probably going to manage knowledge workers. They know more about what they're doing than you do. Well, if I'm managing people who know more about what they're doing than I do, I can't tell them what to do and how to do it. I have to ask, I have to listen, and I have to learn. So a very, very different way of looking at leadership. And the first thing I teach leaders is to learn how to ask. Ask a question, how can I be a better leader? One of my great coaching clients is a man named Hubert Jolie, very proud of Hubert Jolie. He was the CEO of a company called Best Buy in America. The company was just tanking. He came in, totally turned the company around, spectacular transformation. And he would always begin every dialogue with this. My name is Hubert Jolie. I am the CEO of Best Buy. I need help. He would ask every employee to help him. Humble, amazing guy, spectacular turnaround. Uh, you know, one of the great CEOs, probably the best CEO in America in the last five years at least. Just an amazing, an amazing man. Well, get in the habit of asking. Now, we all understand the theory of asking, yet we don't do it. We don't do it in life. Uh, you know what? If you can send me messages, can people send me messages in the chat box? If that's possible, I'd love to get some messages. Uh, I'm going to ask you all a question. And if the answer is yes, I'd like you to write in the chat box, yes. And if the answer is no, you write no. All right. Are we ready? In your fine organizations, is customer satisfaction important? Yes or no? Oh, I see a lot of yeses coming in. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. Very good. This is working. Yes, yes, yes. Now I have a second question. Should we ask our customers for input in terms of how we can get better? Should we ask our customers and learn from these people? Yes or no? What do I see? More yeses. Very good, very good. Okay, now stop sending in for a second. I have another question. If you have a husband, wife, or partner at home, have you been asking your husband or wife, what can I do to be a better partner in our relationship? No, 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 a few yeses, <laughs> lots of no's. 
<laughs> the scores don't look quite so good anymore. So you see all the... <laughs> Someone said sometimes, no. <laughs> well, you see, uh, one person said I'm single. Good, you can learn something. Well, very important. Everything I teach doesn't just apply at work. It applies at home. So get in that habit of asking a question. How can I be a better? Not only how can I be a better manager or Hubert Jolie, how can I be a better CEO? How can I be a better father? How can I be a better brother, sister? How can I be a better mother? How can I be a better son or daughter? When my daughter Kelly was 11 years old and my son Brian was nine years old, I began asking my children a question. What can I do to be a better father? If it's worthwhile to say, what can I do to be a better boss? What's even more important? What can I do to be a better parent? My daughter said, Daddy, you travel a lot. That's not what bothers me. What bothers me is the way you act when you come home. Talk on the phone, you watch sports, you don't spend time with me. She said, one time it was Saturday. And I wanted to go to a party at my friend's house and mommy did not let me go. I had to stay home and spend time with you. And then she said, you spent no time with me. That was not right. What could I, what could I say? But thank you. I said, Daddy must do better. I said, I'm going to keep track of how many days I can spend four hours with my family. 1991, 92 days. 1992, 110. 1993, 131. 1994, 135. I made more money the year I spent 135 days, four hours with my family, than the year I spent 20 days. What did I learn? San Diego Chargers American football team don't care about me. Well, now it's January 1, 1995. Both kids are teenagers. Daddy's proud. I said, kids, look, 135 days, four hours with daddy. What goal this year? How about 150? They both go, no, 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 daddy. Too much, too much. <laughs> My son said, 50 is better. You've overachieved. I learned a good lesson. When the kids are little, it's good to do this. Why? They need us. When they get older, it becomes important for a very different reason. What is it? We need them. Everything I'm going to teach you today applies at work, applied at home too. The people at home are more important than people at work. And never get so busy climbing that corporate ladder of success, you forget about the people who love you. So step one I teach people is ask for input. And then step two is listen to it. Listen. And the first thing we want to do when we ask for input is the last thing we should do. Ask for input, then express my opinion. If I ask you for input and immediately start talking, what's that sound like? Defensiveness, denial, rationalization. Ask, listen, don't make excuses. And step three is think. The greatest leader I've ever met in my life, and I've met many, many wonderful leaders. I've met four CEOs of the year in the United States that I've coached. The greatest leader I've ever met is a woman named Frances Hesselbein. Peter Drucker said she's the greatest leader he's ever met. She was CEO of the Girl Scouts of America. I love her, she's beautiful travels all the time, 106 years old now. She does one thing before she talks that almost none of us do. What's that? I think. What do most of us do when we get feedback? What do most of us do when we get angry? What does she do? Breathe and think not only what am I going to say, how am I going to say it? Ask, listen, think. And then the next thing is thank people. And don't punish people that try to help us. Now, we're going to do that yes exercise again, okay? So I'm going to look at your uh, little chat box here. If the answer is yes, you write in yes. Do you agree with me that companies should encourage people to tell the truth? Yes, yes, lots of yeses. And would you agree with me that punishing the messenger, punishing people to try to help us, punishing those brave people to tell the truth, well, that would be a very bad idea. Yeah, yes. punishing the messenger. Yeah, most people say, yeah, yeah, very bad idea. And then, of course, I'm assuming most of you would not do this. At least in your mind, you wouldn't do this. Now, I'm going to give you a great study of punishing the messenger and see if you actually do believe this or it's something you just talk. Are you ready for the case study? You have a hard day at work, a hard day. You go home. Your husband, wife, friend, or partner is there. And you get a car to go to the store. You're driving to the store. Lots of traffic. Cars are cutting in front of you. That person in the front seat goes, look out, there's a red light up ahead. Did you say, thank you, thank you? Or perhaps something that sounded like, what do you mean there's a red light up ahead? Don't you think I can see I know how to drive this car? Why don't you let me drive? Well, most of us, what response do we choose? Option B, 
We yell at the other person. Why? It's very hard to do these things. Ask, listen, thank people. Think about what they say and thank them. Don't punish them. I want to give you two examples of punishing the messenger, very negative and a positive. First, the negative. There's a wonderful book called The Checklist Manifesto. The Checklist Manifesto, published by Dr. Atul Gawande from Harvard Medical School. In the book, he makes a sobering point. If you go in for a surgery and the nurse asks a doctor a series of simple questions from a checklist before the surgery, the odds on unneeded infection plummet and the death rates cut by two thirds. This is not a theory, it's a fact. The huge majority of hospitals around the world do not allow the nurse to ask the doctor the question. Why ego? What's the first question in the series? Did you wash your hands? According to Dr. Gwandi, more people died because of the egos of surgeons and died in the Vietnam War, the Afghan War, and the Iraqi War put together. And that's just in the United States. I doubt India is any better. Why? The surgeon is too proud to ask for input. They're too proud to admit they need help. Well, you know one thing I've learned? We all need help. My book triggers, I'm very proud of that book. Why am I so proud? 27 major CEOs endorsed that book. Why am I proud of that? 30 years ago, no CEO would admit to having a coach. He would have been ashamed to have a coach, embarrassed to have a coach. Today, these people are saying, I need help. I'm CEO of the year in the United States. I need help. I won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I need help. I'm president of the World Bank. I need help. I'm the CEO of Walmart. I need help. Who are we kidding? We all need help. I have someone call me on the phone every day to help me. Why? My name is Marshall Goldsmith. I'm too cowardly and undisciplined to do all this stuff I teach by myself. I'm too cowardly and too undisciplined to do it by myself. I don't have that much willpower. I need help. We all need help. And once we make peace with that, life is so much better. Life is so much better. So ask, listen, think, thank people. And the next thing is respond. Respond to feedback. And here's how I teach people if you ever get 360 degree feedback and all my clients do is how to respond to it. Positive, simple, focused, and fast. Positive, simple, focused, and fast. They say, thank you so much for participating in this confidential feedback. I have nothing to lose much to gain. Much of my feedback is positive. They talk about the positives and they say, I don't know who said what. I just want to say how grateful I am for the good feedback I did receive. Then they don't say, but they say, and there's something I'd like to improve. For example, I want to be a better listener. Then they apologize. They say, you know what? If I haven't listened to you or the other people in the past, I'm sorry. Please accept my apologies. There's absolutely no excuse. Then they don't ask for more feedback about the past. We do something called feed forward, ask for ideas for the future. They say, I'm not going to ask for more feedback about the past. I can't change the past. I'm going to ask for ideas for future. Give me ideas to help me be a more positive and open-minded listener in the future. And then they just shut up and say, thank you, no matter what the person says. They never promise to do everything people say. Leadership's not a popularity contest. They promise to listen to the ideas, think about them, and do what they can. Then they say, I'm going to follow up with you. I'm going to involve you and ask you to help me get better. So the next step is involve those people and then change. I've been in business for 12 years before anybody asked me what I consider to be the great existential question. What was it? Does anybody ever really change? I looked at this person and said, I have a degree in math. I have no research to prove it. So I guess I do not know. Well, that was a long time ago, over 30 years ago. Now I do know. I know who changes, who doesn't change, why people change and why people do not change. The key to making change last is you have to follow up and stick with it. What does that sound like? Mr. Coworker, two months ago, I said I want to be a positive and open-minded listener. In the last two months, think about my behavior. Give me ideas for the next two months. It's been four months, give me ideas, six months, eight months, 10 months. What happens if you engage in this very, very detailed, very clear, very simple follow-up process? Well, we have research from 86,000 people around the world. If anybody would like to see the research, I can send you a copy of it. It's a study called Leadership as a Contact Sport. My email address is marshall, M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L at marshallgoldsmith.com. Hey, our research is very clear. When people say, you know, my manager went to that leadership program or had a coach, but didn't talk to me and did no feedback, improvement looks like random chance. Little, feed, little follow up, a little better, some follow up a lot better, frequent follow up much better, consistent or periodic follow up, huge improvement. So, what did I learn from the process? Well, the people I taught, they went to the same program, 
it's taught by the same person in most cases me they get feedback on the same process at the same time what did i learn about the people i work with well if you get better it doesn't have much to do with me it's got everything to do with you now today i'm going to share as much as i can what i know with you and my mission is just to help you have a little better life the stuff I'm going to teach you works. Uh, this is research from 86,000 people. We've replicated the research with 248,000 people. This works every place. By the way, some of the best scores in the world are in India. It works great in India. So yeah, this stuff works. It just doesn't happen to work if you don't do it. And everything I'm going to teach you during our little time together is going to be very simple. It's easy to understand. It's not easy to do. And I'm going to talk about the challenge, not of understanding what I teach, but doing it. And the great leaders that I've worked with, the difference between the great ones, the ones that got better, the ones that had huge positive impact, and the ones that did okay, and the ones that did nothing, wasn't me. I was not a better coach. The difference is them. They're the ones that had the courage to look in the mirror the humility to admit they can improve as leaders and the dedication to follow up over and over and over again and try to get better and try to get better. Well, enough of me talking, enough of me talking. Let's go to the good professor. Professor, do you have any good questions for me now? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, just before uh, Professor KP takes the question, I request all participants to please post their questions in the Q&A box. For Dr. Marshall Goldsmith, please post your questions in the Q&A box. Yes, Kirti, please. Hello, Professor Goldsmith. Lovely to reconnect again. Good to see you again. Same here. Uh, when, when you began this talk, one of the statements you made is that the leaders of the future need to be different from the leaders of the past. Yes. Uh, and uh, could you share a little bit more about that with us? Well, if you look at the history of leadership, the leader knew more than the people being led. The old models of leadership where the king was the ruler, he allegedly knew more, was allegedly descended from God. The um, master and the apprentice. The master knew more than the apprentice. So the model of leadership was that, you know, these people who know more get promoted and they know more than everyone. And then people learn from them, kind of that master apprentice model, which was pretty accurate for the past. For the future though, we manage knowledge workers. These are technology people. They are typically often younger than us. They know more than we do about what they're doing. So we live in a quite different world today. And in today's world, and even more important in tomorrow's world, very important to face the fact that they're gonna know more than you. Now, this is very hard. By the way, this is easy to understand in our head. It's hard in our heart. Why? Uh, as I mentioned to you, we have been socially conditioned to prove how smart we are over and over and over and over and over again. It's very difficult not to try to be the smartest person. It's very difficult not to be the most clever. It's very difficult to say, you know, these people, they know more about what they're doing than I do and be okay with that. It's very difficult to do more like my friend Hubert Jolie to stand up and say, my name is Hubert Jolie. I'm the CEO of this company, please help me. Leaders historically have not done that. Not only have they not done it in India, they've not done it anywhere. It's a different world today. It's a different world today and you see, when you, let me give you another great learning from Peter Drucker. He said this, your best people can get another job in a very short period of time and probably get a pay raise. Most of you, the very best people you manage can leave. They can get another job and they can get a pay raise if they leave. Let me tell you how, to, how, how you have to treat these people. They're volunteers. Now you might say, no, they're not volunteers. I'm paying them. So what? You're paying them. The guy across the street is going to pay them more. They don't need you. You need them. At the end of his career, Peter Drucker learned a lot about leadership, watching people like my friend Francis Hesselbein, who managed volunteers. Because the greatest people that you are leading today in most organizations are volunteers. Years. They don't have to be there. By the way, this was true in the past. It's never been more true than today. 
they don't have to be there. And if they are mistreated, and if you try to talk down to them and act superior to them, the best, by the way, here's the worst part. The best people will leave, even worse, the worst people will stay. The worst people will stay. Why? They don't have any place else to go. So you're going to end up losing the top and keeping the bottom if you do this as a leader. So excellent question. What would be your mission? Do you have a, a huge amount of experience working with uh, executives and uh, uh, leaders? What, according to you, are the classic challenges faced by leaders today? What, according to you, is are those important issues that are there for them? Okay, um, good. And again, I like to take things out of the abstract theory realm and have people apply it to our own lives, both at work and at home. So let's uh, give my first classic problem. I was interviewed in the Harvard Business Review and asked a question. What is the number one problem of all the successful people you have worked with over the years? What is their number one problem? And my answer, winning too much, winning too much. Now, what does this mean? If it is important, we want to win. Meaningful, we want to win. Critical, we want to win. Trivial, we want to win. Not worth it, we want to win anyway. Winners love winning. Now, the people in your school, are they losers or winners? Winners. Big winners. Does your school admit everyone who applies? No, 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 no. Only a tiny number of people. Now, I'll tell you the joke about IIT, the engineering school. Hopefully your school is not quite as bad as them. The joke, the great IIT joke. How do you know the IIT engineer is smart? How do you know this? You hang around them five minutes and they tell you over and over and over again. <laughs> well, it's very hard for smart, successful people not to constantly win and prove that we're right. Let me give you a case study. And I wanted you to send some notes in on our chat box, if you don't mind. I'm going to give you two options, A and B. So on the chat box, after I finish, just write A or B, okay? Now, here's our first case. You want to go to dinner at restaurant X. X. Your husband, wife, friend, or partner wants to get to dinner at restaurant Y. Hmm. You have a heated argument. You go to the restaurant Y. It was not your choice. The food tastes awful and the service is terrible. Option A, you could critique the food, point out our partner was wrong. You know, this mistake could have been avoided had only you listened to me, 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 me. Option B, shut up, eat the stupid food, try to enjoy it and have a nice evening. <laughs> well, what would I do? What should I do? Most of my clients, what would I do? Critique the food. What should I do? Shut up. <laughs> shut up. It's very hard sometimes just to shut up, eat the food, and enjoy it. Just eat the food and enjoy it. Now, let me give you um, let me give you another case study that's even worse. You have a hard day at work, a hard day. You go home, your husband, wife, friend, or partner's there, and the other person says, I had such a hard day today. I had such a tough day today. If we're not careful, what do we say? You had a hard day. You had a hard day. Do you have any idea what I had to put up with today? Do you think you had a hard day? We're so competitive, we have to prove we're more miserable than the people we live with. I gave this example to my class at the, I used to teach at the Dartmouth Tuck School. And I gave this example to my class at Dartmouth. A young man raised his hand. He said, I did that last week. I said to him, I asked him, what happened? He said, my wife looked at me. She said, honey, you just think you've had a hard day. It is not over. <laughs> it's not over. <laughs> well, now I'm going to give you an email about this that one of my students sent to me. If anyone on this call would send me such an email after this program, I would be very proud of this program. I would be very proud of this program. A young man sent me an email and he said, I know you do not remember me. I was in your class at Dartmouth five years ago. 
I wanted to send you an email today and say thank you. He said, yesterday I was having a terrible day at work and I was under all kinds of pressure and behind schedule. And my wife called and she started telling me what a terrible day she was having. I was just getting ready to point out how her problems paled in significance to my problems. For some reason, I remembered your course and I thought, this is my wife. This is someone I love. This is not the enemy. He said, I just listened to her and I said, thank you for everything you're doing for the family and for your work. I love you. He said, I went home. I spent $25. I bought her some flowers. I gave her the flowers and I said, I love you. He said, that was the best $25 I've ever spent. Thank you. Well, the next time we feel this need to win, prove how smart we are, prove how right we are, breathe, breathe, breathe and ask a very simple question. What am I winning? What am I winning? What am I winning? Well, the second thing, and I'll give you two of leaders that I coach, classic problem. And the second one is very bad for engineers. If there are any engineers, and again, uh, Professor Vishal, you are afflicted with this engineering disease, by the way. So if we do have any engineers on the call, this is a, engineers are the worst at this next one. The second problem is called adding too much value. Now, engineer is awful. An engineer who becomes a professor, I can't even imagine how bad this one is, but adding too much value. Now, now, what does that mean? I am young, smart, enthusiastic, and you're my boss. I come to you with an idea. You think it's a great idea. Rather than just saying great idea, our natural tendency is to say, that is a nice idea. Why don't you add this to it? Well, the problem is the quality of the idea may go up this much. My commitment to execute the idea may go down that much. It's no longer my idea, boss. Now it's your idea. It's incredibly difficult for smart, successful people not to constantly go through life adding value. One of my good coaching clients retired a few years ago. His name is J.P. Garnier. J.P., a guy from France, was the CEO of a very large drug company, GlaxoSmithKline. I asked J.P., what did you learn about leadership as the CEO of GlaxoSmithKline? He said, I've learned a very hard lesson. And all you people listening, especially you younger people listening, Every time you get promoted in life, this lesson will become more real for you. Every time you get promoted in life, this lesson will become more real for you. He said, my suggestions become orders. My suggestions become orders. Now, he said, if they're smart, they're orders. If they're stupid, they're orders. If I want them to be orders, they are orders. And if I do not want them to be orders, they're orders anyway. When you're the CEO of GlaxoSmithKline, you don't make suggestions, you give orders. For nine years, I trained admirals in the United States Navy. Whereas the first thing I would always teach the new admirals, when you get that little star, your suggestions become orders. Admirals do not make suggestions. When an admiral makes a suggestion, what is the response? Sir, yes, sir. That suggestion becomes an order. I asked JP, what did you learn from me when I was your coach that helped you the most? He said, you taught me one lesson that helped me be a better leader and have a happier life. That was his coach before he was the CEO. He also said, if I had not learned this lesson, I would have never become the CEO of this company. I said, what was the lesson? He said, before I speak, breathe, breathe. And ask one question, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And he said, as the CEO of this huge organization, if I have the discipline to stop and breathe and ask myself, is it worth it? 50% of the time, what did I decide? Am I right? Maybe. Is it worth it? No. I want everybody listening to me now to breathe. Breathe. Think about the last time you got into a heated argument with someone you love. And you had a need to win and prove they were wrong on a minor or insignificant point. Was it worth it? No. When you're at work, breathe and ask yourself, is my comment going to improve this person's commitment? If the answer is no, breathe again. Is it worth making? Now, sometimes it is anyway. 
as JP said, half the time he said something, but half the time he didn't. At home, breathe. Is my comment going to improve my relationship with this person I love? If the answer is no, should I say it? Well, if you have to think about it at work, as JP said, about half the time, it's not worth it. If you have to ask that question at home, it is almost never worth it. So good question. I've given you two of the top problems. Give me your next good question. Question, as leaders, sometimes we have to give orders. At other times we have to, you know, influence people. Uh, and yet at other times we have to encourage people to change. And um, we experience at times that people are resistant to change. They do not wish to make that change. Mm -hmm. So how do we, you know, help people shift uh, when we think that this change is valuable and we would like to encourage them to change? Very good question. When I coach people, how do I coach people who really don't want to change? Wonderful question. And the answer is very simple. Two words. I don't. <laughs> I make zero effort coaching people who do not want to change. You see, I only coach people that do want to change. In my coaching, I don't get paid if my clients don't get better. Better is not judged by me or them. It's judged by everyone around them. I don't waste my time with people who don't care. If they don't care, you know what I tell them? Good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I am not in the motivational speech business. I help people who want to get better, get better. People don't want to get better, don't waste your time. Now, most people listening never get these points. If you deeply understand these points, by the way, if you learn nothing from me today but this, you're going to have a better life and be happier. The client I coach who improved the most is named Alan Mullally. Alan and I are working now together on a book. I was coached 25 years ago when he was at Boeing. He left Boeing to become the CEO of Ford. The stock goes from $1 to $18.40 when he was the CEO. The stock went up 1,837% when he was the CEO of Ford amazing man. He had a 97% approval rating from every employee in a union company. I talked to Alan, my friend. I said, Alan, of all the people I've ever coached, I spent the least time coaching you and you improved the most. And the person I spent the most amount of time with didn't improve at all. I made a chart for you engineers, a chart on one dimension. It said time spent with the executive coach, Marshall Goldsmith. The other dimension was improvement. There was a negative correlation between spending time with me and getting better. I said, well, that's troubling. So I talked to my friend, Alan. I said, Alan, the way this chart looks, had you never met me, you'd be even better. What should, I, what should I learn, Alan, about coaching from you? My friend, Alan, who's probably the best CEO in America in the last 40 years, taught me a great lesson. He said, Marshall, your whole job as a coach is customer selection. If you pick the best customers, your coaching process will always work. And you pick the wrong customer, your coaching process will never work. And then he said something even better. Never make coaching about yourself and your own ego and how smart you think you are. Make it about the wonderful people you coach and how hard they work and how proud you are of them. And then he said, as the leader of the Ford, my job wasn't different. I don't design the cars, build the cars, sell the cars. I must have great people. And then he said, every day I would tell myself, leadership's not about me, leadership's about them. Well, for the great achiever, and by the way, I'm betting almost everyone on this call is a great individual achiever. You're not getting in your school if you're not a great individual achiever. That doesn't mean you're a great leader. That does not mean you're a great leader. There's a long way between I'm a great achiever and I'm a great leader. A great achiever, it's maybe all about me. A great leader, it's all about them. It's very difficult to make this transition between the great achiever and great leader. Most of us never, do, never deeply understand this. I'm going to ask the group uh, yes and no questions. If the answer is yes, I want you to write yes. The answer is no. I want you to write no. All you listeners, uh, have you ever attempted to change the behavior, including, by the way, my fine panelists, have you ever attempted to change the behavior of your husband, wife, or partner that had absolutely no interest in changing? Have any of us tried that before? Yes or no? Oh, oh, lots of yeses. Yes, people have tried that. Yes, very, very good. Very good. Yes. And then most of us have tried this. Yes. And then, uh, uh, then my next question is, how is that working out for you? That attempting to change the partner, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. It's not working. No, no, not good. Doesn't work. No one doesn't work. Doesn't work at all. No good. No good. No good. <laughs> 
Now I'm going to ask a second question. Now, Professor Kirti and, and Professor Vishal, you must raise your hand if the answer is yes. Have any of you ever attempted to change the behavior of mommy or daddy who had no interest in changing before? Come on. Oh, look at these hands go. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, Professor Kirti, I'm going to call on you. Have you been attempting to change mommy or daddy or both? Both? She's attempting to change both mommy and daddy. Uh, how's that working out for you? Well, no, very bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> I was teaching my class at Dartmouth. A woman raised her hand. I said, are you attempting to change mommy or daddy? She said, daddy. I asked her, what is daddy's problem? She said, daddy does not have a healthy lifestyle. He does not have a healthy lifestyle. I asked her, how old is daddy? She said, 94 years old. <laughs> the old man's 94 years old. Leave him alone. You want to smoke a cigar, old man? Smoke too. Who cares? He's 94 years old. Well, you know what? If you don't learn anything from coaching to me, but there's one lesson taught to me by my great client, Alan Mulally, you're going to be a better coach and have a happier life. If they don't care, don't waste your time. If they don't care, don't waste your time. And when I'm dealing, I'm talking about adults, not children, but when you're dealing with adults, if they don't care, don't waste your time. Yeah. How do I motivate people? I don't. These are adults. If I have to motivate them to do something, come on, grow up. I don't waste my time with those people. I just work with people that do care. And you know, the good news is plenty of them, plenty of them, just work with them. By the way, I always get ranked number one coach in the world. Why? Nobody knows I'm a good coach. Nobody knows I'm a good coach. Why do I always get ranked number one coach? I may not be the best coach in the world. I have the best clients in the world. My clients are amazing people. I love my clients. They're wonderful people. To be honest, anybody would look like a good coach if you coach the people I coach. They're so spectacular that I don't have to do that much. Most of them getting better has little to do with me, but it has a lot to do with them. So um, a related question, uh, uh, Marshall. Uh, there are many times as, as an individual, you may want to think about uh, influencing people on whom you do not have a uh, direct line of authority. So you may you don't have an authority over them, but still you may want to influence them. And this, this is crucial for maybe younger people, people down the line. Uh, any thoughts on how would you, how would you do that, uh, Marsha? Very good point, especially for the younger people on the line. Now, for you younger people on the line, I have some very bad news for you. It is highly unlikely your first job will be CEO of the company. So unless you're the founder, if you work for a big company, it's highly unlikely you will be the CEO of the company. So you're probably going to have bosses. Now, how do I influence people when I do not have direct line authority? This is a lesson also taught to me by the great Peter Drucker. Again, this is one of those lessons, if you just learned this lesson, you're going to have a better life. You're going to be happier. It's a very valuable lesson. Peter Drucker taught me this. First, our mission in life is to make a positive difference, not to prove that we're right and not to prove that we're smart. We are not here on earth to prove how smart we are. We are not here on earth to prove how right we are. We are here on earth to make a positive difference. If you do not make a positive difference, it does not matter how smart you are and it does not matter how right you are. Learning point number two from Peter Drucker, every decision in life is made by the person who has the power to make the decision. Make peace with that. Every decision in life is made by the person who has the power to make the decision. Decisions are made based on one and only one variable, power. Whoever has the power to make the decision is going to make the decision. Learning point three, if I need to influence you and you have the power to make the decision and I need to influence you to make a positive difference, there's one word to describe you, customer. There's one word to describe me, salesperson. Customers never have to buy. Salespeople have to sell. Customers never have to buy. Salespeople have to sell. 
It's never the customer's problem. And then finally, from Peter Drucker, sell what you can sell. Change what you can change. If you can sell it, sell it. If you can change it, change it. If you cannot sell it and you cannot change it, let it go. Don't waste your life fighting battles where you're going to make no difference. Invest your life fighting battles where you can make a difference, where you can make a difference. Very, very good learning. If you get this at a young age, number one, you're going to be more effective at influencing people at all levels. Number two, you're going to be happier because you're going to quit wasting your time on what you cannot change. As I've grown older, my level of aspiration in life has actually gone down and down and down and down. My level of impact has gone up and up and up and up. Why? I quit worrying about what I'm not going to change. I just try to focus on what I can change. Just focus on what I can change. And before you deal with any topic, this is a question from my book, Triggers. A great question to ask yourself. Am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? Am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? The answer to that question is yes, go for it. I mean, even if it's a big topic, even if you're Mahatma Gandhi, you're trying to change India, go for it. If the answer is no, you're not really trying to make a positive difference. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Good. Okay. Next question. Master, are there uh, any techniques or any you know best practices that individuals could follow if they want to enhance their day-to-day -day effectiveness as individuals? Now, I didn't quite get that question. Can you say it one more time? Are there any techniques or any best practices that professionals or leaders could follow in order to enhance their effectiveness? Well, I'm going to give day -to -day effectiveness. I'm going to give you one right now. Very good question. Okay. I'm now going to teach everyone listening something that's going to take you three minutes a day to execute. Three minutes. And by the way, uh, Professor Kirti and Professor Vishal and Mr. Piyush, I want you all to do this yourselves. I'm going to teach you something that takes three minutes a day, costs nothing, is going to help you get better at almost anything. Some of you are skeptical. Three minutes a day, costs nothing, help me get better at almost anything. That sounds too good to be true. Half the people that start doing this quit within two weeks. And they do not quit because it doesn't work. They quit because it does work. Anybody that tells me what I'm going to teach you next is easy has never done it before. This is very hard to do. Most people can't do it at all. I have someone call me on the phone to make sure I do it. Why? I know how difficult it really is. If somebody asked me, don't you understand the theory of how to change behavior? I wrote the theory. I wrote the theory. That's why I know I need help. I'm not better than this stuff. Now, this is called the daily question process, and here's how it works. Get out a spreadsheet, and on one column, write down a series of questions that represent what's most important in your life. Could be friends or family or colleagues or direct reports, whatever it is, whatever is most important in your life. Every question must be answered with a yes, a no, or a number. Yes is recorded as a one, no is a zero, or a number. For example, how many push-ups did I do as a number? Every day, fill out the form. Seven boxes across, one for every day of the week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. At the end of the week, you'll get a report card. I'm going to warn everyone on this call in advance. The report card you look at at the end of the week will not be as beautiful as the corporate values plaque you see stuck up on the wall. I've been doing this for 25 years. You know what I've learned? Life is easy to talk and hard to live. Life is easy to talk and hard to live. You know, in my introduction, you said all those nice things about me and all those awards. It's funny you left one thing out of my introduction. It's funny you left it out. What is that? I have the amazing ability to screw something up every day. You managed to skip that on my introduction. I noticed that, that incredible ability to screw something up every day. Well, if you do this every day, you get to look at it. 
and it's hard. For example, one of my questions is, how many times yesterday did you try to prove you were right when it wasn't worth it? And my two professors on the call there, have you ever tried to prove you were right when it wasn't worth it before? Yeah, I guess every now and again. Yeah. <laughs> Do we constantly annoy our friends and family members by proving how right we are? Yes, yeah. Another question is, uh, how many angry or destructive comments did you make about other people yesterday? You know, I don't see so many zeros on my scorecard. We do not like other people to stab us in the back. Why are we stabbing them in the back? Well, if you do this every day, uh, how many steps did I take? How many push-ups? How many sit-ups? How much do you weigh? Just the questions about life so every day. How many minutes did you write? All those books didn't write themselves, right? Well, it's hard. My friend Jim Moore would tell you this saved his life. It didn't kind of save his life or sort of save his life. It did save his life. What's well, one of his questions every day? Are you currently updated on your physical examination? The first 90 days he did this, he said no every day. After 90 days, he said, this is embarrassing. I have to get the stupid exam or quit asking. He got the stupid exam. What the doctor say? You have cancer. You have cancer. Well, that was many years ago. He's fine. He was 65. The doctor said, had you waited seven more months, you'd be dead. He knew he should have gotten the exam. He just didn't do it. If you hold the mirror in front of your face every day, it's very hard to hide. Now, I was sharing this with my daughter, Kelly. She knows more about research than I do. And she brought up a great idea that I always now execute in my teaching. It's called active questions. She said, you know, Daddy, almost everything in employee engagement that they ask people is a passive question. Do you have clear goals? Do you have meaningful work? Do you have a friend at work? There's nothing wrong with these questions. Yet, if we ask a passive question and things are negative, we blame the environment. It's their fault. Do you have clear goals? No. Why not? They're confused. Do you have meaningful work? No, they don't give you meaningful work. Do you have a friend at work? No, they're stupid. Whose fault is it? Them. Kelly said, try asking active questions that begin with the phrase, did I do my best too? So I'm going to give you six questions to test yourself on every day. And our research on these six questions is amazing. Uh, and by the way, if you'd like a copy of the study, send me an uh, email to say uh, daily questions. I'll send you a copy of the daily questions. And by the way, if you want my own daily questions, I'll send you mine too. But the point is, don't use mine because they're mine. You write your own questions. That's the whole idea. But the do, there are six questions I do recommend, and they begin with the phrase that says, did I do my best to? Did I do my best to? Number one, set clear goals. Did I do my best today to set clear goals? Number two, did I do my best today to make progress toward achieving my goals? Question three, did I do my best to find meaning? Question four, we're going to spend some time on. Did I do my best to be happy? Did I do my best today to be happy? Now, um, in my book, Triggers, and obviously I have the rights to use their name, they are in the book, I talk about three medical doctors that I've coached. They're all medical doctors, and they're among the smartest people I've ever met. One is Dr. Jim Kim. Dr. Jim Kim has a simultaneous MD and PhD with honors from Harvard in anthropology in five years. To put this in context, a normal human being who gets an anthropology PhD from Harvard takes eight years. So he got one in five years with honors and got a medical degree at the same time. He went on to become head of Partners in Health, saved millions of human lives. He went on to become president of Dartmouth College and then became president of the World Bank. And now he's vice chairman of Global Investment Partners, a wonderful person. I love Dr. Jim. Another person is Dr. Raj Shah. Dr. Raj Shah was Indian American of the year in the United States, formerly head of the USAID, and then went on to become head of the Rockefeller Foundation. I love Dr. Raj. And Dr. John Noseworthy, head of the Mayo Clinic, number one hospital in the world. All three brilliant people ask a question. One to 10 scale on an average day, 10 is high, one is low. How would you score an answer to this question? Did I do my best to be happy? All three had the same question, the same answer. All three had the same answer. It never dawned on me to try to be happy. It never dawned on me to try to be happy. They're all medical doctors. I said, you know, you went to medical school 
did it dawn on you that you're going to die? Did they cover that in medical school, death? They said, yeah, they, they cover that death thing. I said, do you think this is a silly question or a trivial question? He said, no, it's a very important question. I just forgot to ask. I was too busy achieving things to think about being happy. I'm gonna ask everybody to write a number in the chat box. I'm just curious, a number. It's a one to 10 scale, 10 is high and one is low. And I want you to write down a number. On an average day, how would you score on the answer to this question? Did I do my best today to be happy? Did I do my best today to be happy? Just write down some numbers. I'm looking at a lot of numbers, sixes, twos, five, nine, wide range of numbers. And as I see the numbers, lots of ones and twos and threes and sixes. Somebody said a zero, sevens. The average score in the world, my guess is, would be very, very close to the average score in the see in this chat box. What's the average score in the, wor in the world on that question? 5.5 out of 10. 5.5. Now, uh, there, Professor Vishal, Remember when you were in engineering school there? Engineering school, remember that? Yeah, yes, much. You took a test and you got a 5.5 out of 10, a 55%. Would you be proud of that score or ashamed of that score? I would be ashamed of this score, but I would not be happy. You would I would not, not be happy with the score as well. Not happy. How about the, how about Dr. Kirti over there? You get that 5.5 out of 10. Would you be happy with that score? Absolutely no. not. <laughs> Definitely not. The test I just gave you was about a thousand times more important than any test you ever took in school. The test I just gave you is about a thousand times more important than any test you ever took in school. All those tests you took, you don't remember any of that stuff. All those thousands of tests and courses, you don't remember that stuff. Yeah, that test I just gave you is a lot more important than that test. And I'm gonna give everybody in this call one suggestion, raise your score, raise your score. The test doesn't even say, was I happy? What's the test say? Did I try to be happy? Did I try to be happy? Raise your score. Now, question number five is, did I do my best to build positive relationships with people? Did I do my best to build positive relationships? Not do I have a friend at work? Was I the friend? And then the finally, the final question is, did I do my best to be fully engaged? Did I do my best to be fully engaged? And easy theory, hard practice. Now, over the COVID period, Every weekend, my partner and I, Mark Thompson, we spent six hours every weekend with 60 amazing people from around the world. And every weekend, they reviewed their daily questions with us for a year. An amazing project. These people included, as I said, the president of the World Bank, uh, the head of St. Jude's Children's Hospital. We had Broadway stars. We had athletes. Uh, amazingly, phenomenally CEOs, phenomenally successful people every weekend. And every weekend they would report on their scores. And even the most successful people in the world, it is amazing how we screw up every week. We forget to set goals. We forget the people we love. We forget to be happy. We forget to be present. We forget to be engaged. We get so caught up in stuff that we forget what matters in life. So my suggestion is try this yourself. Now I'm gonna give you a warning. You probably can't do it by yourself. I can't, it's too hard. If you can't do it by yourself, it's okay. I can't do it by myself. Get somebody to help you, get somebody to help you. And I have someone call me every day. I review my daily questions every day. It's a very humbling experience. It's a very humbling experience because what you learn is we're all humans and no matter how great we are, we make mistakes. I'll give you a funny story that's in my next book. One of the people on my weekend calls is Pau Gasol, P-A-U, Pau, G-A-S-O-L, Gasol, a basketball player. Pau is probably uh, well, the greatest basketball player ever from Spain. 
His brother, Mark Gasol, is also a professional basketball player. Pat played for the Los Angeles Lakers, won two world championships, just is a great guy, five-time Olympian. Now he has a foundation. He's on the Olympic Committee. So I, I love the guy. He's got 7 million followers on Twitter. So Pal is a member of our group. So one of the questions Pal is working on is, did I do my best to be present with my wife? You know, his wife just had a baby and she's young and he's working out. And does he want to be present? His wife said, Pal, he said, how can I be a better husband? She said, you'd be more present. Even when you're around me, you're checked out. You're not paying attention. You know, you're distracted. You need to be more present. So he said, I'm going to do this. <laughs> so one of the weeks I said, okay, Pal, how'd you do? Very bad. Very bad. His wife said, you're not paying attention to me. You're not present at all. You're checked out. And you know what he said? Marshall, I was tired. I was tired. I worked out all day. I'm getting ready for the Olympics. You see, I had a trainer at home. I was tired, tired. So I said, tired. That's very interesting, pal. I said, you know, a few years ago, I paid $1,000 and my son paid $1,000 for two seats to watch the World Basketball Championship NBA Finals featuring you and the Los Angeles Lakers against the Boston Celtics. You know, pal, I was watching that game. You were just running up and down the court like a banshee. And when there was two minutes ago, Phil Jackson, your coach, called a timeout. Now I said, pal, were you tired? Oh, he said, I was exhausted. I remember that game, totally exhausting. Did you go to your coach and say, you know, coach, I'm tired. Why don't you take me out, coach? I'm kind of tired. He said, no, I would never say that to my coach. I said, you said it to your wife. Who's more important, your coach or your wife? Well, his wife wasn't impressed with I'm tired. He's never too tired to play basketball. Was never too tired to play basketball. So very important, like I said, these questions. Don't just do it at work, do it at home. So anyway, Professor, excellent question. Thank you. I want to uh, build up Marshall on on this uh, aspect of happiness, happiness thing that you mentioned, the fourth question. Uh, Again, there is a lot of, uh, when we talk about happiness, there is also a question of our purpose, uh, meaning and uh, stuff around that. So can you tell us in your experience, how, how, do, how do people connect to that higher purpose? How do people find that in your experience? What would be that advice? How to connect, identify that purpose and connect with it? Okay, very good. Now, I'm going to share something from my new book. My new book is called The Earned Life. The Earned Life. It's not out yet. It'll be out in May. It's pretty much written, though, The Earned Life. In my book, The Earned Life, uh, Professor, we talk about this. I want you to think of three dimensions in your life. I'm just going to take my time and go through each of the three. But everything I tell you about, I want you to think not only how does this apply to them, how does this apply to me? My theory in life is if I don't know how this applies to me, I do not really understand it. I'm just talking. How does this apply to me? Here are the three dimensions. One dimension is called our aspiration. Our aspiration is our higher purpose, our deeper meaning, and our aspiration never has a finish line. It's never done. Our aspiration is what we are becoming what we are becoming, our higher purpose, what we're trying to become, there is no finish line, there is no goal. The second dimension is our ambition. Our ambition involves our achievement of goals. And by definition, a goal has a very specific timeline. A goal has a finishing point. And then the third dimension is our action. Our action is what am I doing now? So think of three dimensions, aspiration, ambition, and action. Most human beings, and I would say not most human beings on this call, because these people are on this call are high achievers, but most human beings in the world are predominantly focused on the action phase. Day-to-day -day life, getting by, play the video game, do what you have to do, eat the food, go to the Bollywood. They're focused on day-to-day -day living, not good or bad, just an is. They're focused on that phase. 
the people I coach, and my guess is many of the people on this call are lost in the ambition phase. In other words, they're addicted to achievement. They're addicted to achievement. Now, there's nothing wrong with achievement, yet there's great thinking in the Bhagavad Gita. What is it? Never become ego attached to the results of what you're doing. Never become ego attached to the outcome of your activities. Many people I coach need to read the Bhagavad Gita. They are addicted to results, addicted to achievement. Here's the problem with achievement. There is a finish line. And by definition, when you are finished, you are finished. One chapter in the book is called After the Victory Lap. What happens after you win? If your whole focus is winning, what happens after you win? Well, let me give you some examples. Michael Phelps, who won more gold medals than anyone in the history of the Olympics, after he won his final gold medal, what did he think about doing? Killing himself. Killing himself. Totally depressed. National Football League in America. 70% bankrupt within five years. These are rich people. 70% become bankrupt in five years. Huge amounts of depression. 80% divorce rates. Why? They're no longer the star. National Basketball Association, not much better. If we become addicted to achievement, here's what happens. Whatever you achieve, next year you think I have to achieve more. One of my coaching clients who's a very wise person is named Albert Burla, B-O-U-R-L-A. Albert is the CEO of Pfizer. I don't know if you all know Pfizer, but they had a big year, very big year. Unfortunately, not that big in India. Shame on India, by the way, on this one, but uh, I love India, but India screwed this one up, right? Not that big in India, but a big year, Pfizer. I talked to Albert. I said, Albert, how's it going? He said, big year. He said, we came up with a vaccine for COVID, big deal. I said, thank you. I took that vaccine. That was very good. Now we have a pill you can take if you get COVID to help you get better. I said, good again. Got a new one coming up just for Omicron. Yay, very good, Albert. Fantastic. Profits, all-time high. Employee engagement, highest ever. Pride in the company, tops. I said, Albert, sounds great. What's your problem? He said, I have a huge problem. Huge problem. Two words. Next year. Next year. Albert Berla, and by the way, I hope this is true, will never have a year like this year for the rest of his life. He will never have a year like this again, unless there's another pandemic, which I hope there isn't. He will never have a year this good. If his definition of value as a human being is achieving goals, he might as well kill himself. Everything is downhill from here. He will never surpass this year. Well, when we get too addicted to achievement of goals, we can miss a lot of things. One is we can miss the day-to-day -day enjoyment of life. And two, if we're not careful, we forget, why am I trying to achieve these goals in the first place? What is my higher purpose? Both of those can get lost very easily. Now, let me tell a story about the marshmallow test. Now, my two professors, are you a psychology background there? Are you familiar with the marshmallow test? Okay. Uh, Professor uh, Kirti there, tell the group about this marshmallow test. Do you want me to share about it? Yeah, the marshmallow test there from Stanford for the yeah, kids. I, I would request, yeah, I would request you to articulate that. It is about the children who were, you know, allowed to take one marshmallow or two marshmallows. But I would love to hear the story from you. Well, what happens is in the marshmallow test, very famous research, you take these kids and you give them a marshmallow. And you say to the kid, if you eat this one marshmallow, you get one. If you wait, oh, two, two if you wait. Well, according to their research, which I think is somewhat exaggerated, the kids that eat one marshmallow become hopeless drug addicts 
and the kids that wait for two all have PhDs from Harvard. So, you know, it's a little bit exaggerated, but the point of the study is delayed gratification is good. And if you delay gratification, you achieve more, you have a, you win more, you have more money, you weigh less, all kinds of stuff. Delayed gratification is good. Almost every self-help book is the same. Delayed gratification is good. We must have discipline. Delayed gratification, a good thing. Here's what they did not do in the test. They did not say to the kid that had two marshmallows, kid, if you wait a little longer, three. Ooh, when you get three, wait some more, four. You have four, wait some more, five, 10. And where does the story end? The story ends with an old man sitting in a room surrounded by thousands of uneaten marshmallows. The point of the story is sometimes you need to eat the marshmallow. The people I coach, they don't have any problems with delayed gratification. They have problems with anything other than delayed gratification. They have trouble just eating the marshmallow. Jack Welch, do you two know who Jack Welch was, former CEO of General Electric, famous man, Jack Welch. My writing partner was Jack Welch's agent. And Jack Welch had a triple bypass surgery and he thought he might die. He fortunately didn't die. And my partner asked him a question. He said, Jack, what did you learn about life? What did you learn about life when you almost died because of your heart problem? What did you realize? You know what Jack Welch said? Why am I drinking the damn cheap wine every night? <laughs> Jack Welch has his wine cellar filled with expensive, fancy, tasty wines. Yet every night he's drinking his cheap wine. <laughs> why? You know why? He was waiting for the wine in his wine cellar to, quote, appreciate in value. What an idiot. You know, he said, I'm Jack Welch. I'm rich. I'm rich. I have a wine cellar that's filled with tasty wine. And every night I'm drinking his damn cheap wine. Why am I doing this? I'm an idiot. You know what? He was right. Who cares how much the wine appreciates? You know, he said, I'm going to be dead anyway. I'm going to be dead anyway. Drink the wine. Don't sit there and wait. Well, you know, sometimes in life, you need to eat the marshmallow. And sometimes in life, you need to drink the wine. Now, the final element, and I see my college professor, not so much in business school, but more in the liberal arts school, you'll see this, is called aspiration. And the good news is aspiration is our higher achievement, our higher sense of purpose, goals, et cetera. You asked me about Professor Kirti. That's our aspiration, what we want to become. It's a great thing to have high levels of aspiration. The problem is if that's all you have and you don't achieve anything, you're back to the Peter Drucker problem. You know, you're proving you're right, but you're not making a positive difference. So the goal of life is three things. One, you do have higher purpose and sense of aspiration. Two, you are trying to achieve something meaningful. And then three, you enjoy the process of doing it you enjoy the process of doing it. And I think, you know, a great guidebook is the, the Bhagavad Gita. And sometimes, by the way, this is one of the most helpful things as a coach I got out of the Bhagavad Gita. And I think very important for people to face this reality. Sometimes in life, we have a choice between two things. One is bad and the other is worse. That's the way the world is. There's not always a good choice. In the Gita, there wasn't a good choice. There were two choices, a bad choice and a worse choice. Well, that's the way life is sometimes. And what to me is the deep learning from the Bhagavad Gita, the deep learning is this. What's the message? Okay, you've got two options, A and B. Pick, pick one. Pick one. Do what you think is right. Do your best. Do not become attached to the results and make peace. Make peace. Pick one, do what you think is right. Don't become attached to the results and you make peace. You make peace. One of the great people in my group, I have a group called 100 Coaches. And our group is basically focused on helping each other and helping others. So the story behind the group is that uh, 
I went to a program called Design the Life You Love. It was put on by a great woman from Turkey named Ayşe Brussel, one of the world's great designers. And she asked a question, who are your heroes? My heroes were very kind and generous people who are great teachers, Peter Drucker, Warren Bennis, Francis Hesselbein, Alan Mulally. I've mentioned them all in this talk. She said, you should be more like your heroes. Why are they your heroes? They're very kind and generous people who never charge me any money for anything. She said, you should be more like them. I decided to adopt 15 people, teach them all I know for free. And the only price is when they get old, they have to do the same thing. I made a little video and put it on LinkedIn. I'm thinking maybe a hundred people would apply and I would adopt 15 people and that'd be nice. And I'll be a nice old man and I teach them all I know and they laugh at my jokes and they get old and do the same thing. I was wrong. Over 18,000 people have applied to be adopted. Now I've adopted about 350 amazing people and the whole philosophy is we just give everything away. By the way, back to this call, I'm not charging you anything for this call. All my material, copy, share, download, duplicate, use any way you can. If you want to put your name on it, go ahead. I don't care. My goal is just to help you have a little better life and hopefully you can help others. And there is kind of a fee that I'm going to give all of you for this call. Help somebody else. Do something for somebody else. Do something for somebody else. That's the charge. And to me, that's a very nice way to look at life. One of the people in our group is Harry Kramer. And back to the Bhagavad Gita, Harry was asked a question. He said, Harry, you were the CEO of a large company called Baxter. You've had to fire people. You've had to lay people off. You've had to deal with very difficult issues. How do you sleep at night? And Harry said, I can always sleep at night. And the question was, how? He said, I asked myself only two questions. And these go back to the Bhagavad Gita. Question one, did I do what I thought was right? Did I do what I thought was right? And question two, did I do my best? If the answer is yes, I did what I thought was right. And yes, I did my best. Then guess what? Make peace. That's all any of us in life can do. All we can do is do what you think. What does the Gita say? You, you do what you think is right. You do your best. Whatever happens is going to happen. You don't get fixated on the results. And you make peace. You make peace. Very good. Really profound words, uh, Marshall. Thank you so much. Uh, do you think anything else? So, yeah, go ahead, Katie. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Marshall, you have written a book, uh, How Women Rise, along with Sally Hegelson. Well, a correction before we go on. Sally Helvikson has written a book, How Women Rise, which I helped out with. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's make sure the right credit goes in the right place. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Could you share some insights or some excerpts from it? Since Sally is not here. Right. I love that book. And I'm going to share a couple of insights. One, and you know, uh, Professor, we've talked about this before for you, but I want everybody in the group to do this. I think... One thing I love about the book, Sally taught me, and it's more true for women than men, according to Sally, who is the world's expert on women and leadership. Women often sacrifice their career for their job. They get so focused on doing a great job that they sacrifice their career. And their assumption is, if I do a great job, I will be promoted. Well, that's wrong on a couple dimensions. One, uh, you may or may not get promoted because the next job isn't the present job, could be different skills. And then two, you may not really be aiming for that next job. And in fact, three is even worse. You do a great job. What does the boss give you? More work to do. You do another great job. What do you get? More work. You do some more great work. What do you get? More work. And then you become indispensable and you never get promoted. Well, Sally's point is, especially for women, do a really good job, but don't do a perfect job. Because the difference between a 95 and a 99 could be more effort than the difference between a zero and a 95. Take that extra huge amount of time and put it into your future, learning, growing, learning about your career. And in the long term, you may be much better off and the world may be much better off and the world much be, may be much better off. Uh, so that's one great point from the book. Now, another great point. Uh, let's see, I'm going to have a little coaching session here with Professor Kirti. Are you ready, Professor Kirti? You brought this up? 
Okay, are you ready? Yes. Okay, question number one. If you became more influential, famous, well-known, more influence over lots of people, would the world be worse off or better off? Okay, Tell the you truth. Know? What do you, better off. I think it would be worse off. Better off. The world would be better off. What do you think, Professor Vishal? Worse off or better off? What are we voting for? Vote for better off. Better off. Mr. Peters, what are we voting for? Worse off or better off? Better off. Better off. Now, question two, Professor Kirti. Uh, have you ever had hesitancy to promote yourself? Has this ever made you uncomfortable? Yes. Okay. What's more important, your desire to help the world or your personal comfort? To help the world. It's very important. You see, with women more than men, I tell them, don't be afraid to try to become more influential. Don't be afraid to try to have more of a difference in the world. Why? If the world is better off because you do this, do it. Do it. If the world is going to be better off because I do it, just do it. Now, let me just finish with a couple of little exercises. I think I have, I have seven minutes left or six minutes. Is that correct? Yep. Okay, so let me take the last six minutes and finish with a couple of exercises. Okay, is everybody ready? I want everybody to put both feet on the ground. Both feet on the ground. Ah, sit back in your chair and breathe. Ah, now I'm going to teach you some exercises that are going to help you make peace with life and be happy. Okay, breathe. Uh, now, I'm a Buddhist. A good Buddhist philosophy is every time I take a deep breath, it's a new me. So take a deep breath and think new me, new me, new me. Everything that was done before this second in time in your life was done by an infinite set of people. They were called the previous me's, the previous years. Close your eyes. Think about all of the previous years. Think about that infinite set of people. Think of all those people have done to help people. Think of the gifts they've given you. Think about how hard all of those previous years tried. Open your eyes. If any group of people did that many nice things, what should you say to those nice people? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Do your hands like this. <clears throat> thank you thank you now did they make a little mistake or two as they journeyed through life do your hand this way hand uh who is the first person we need to learn how to forgive forgive this person i've asked thousands of parents around the world this question when my child grows up i want my child to be what's the number one answer from parents around the world no matter what country i'm in happy happy you want your kids to be happy? You want your parents to be happy? You want the people who love you to be happy? You go first. You be happy. Now I'm going to finish with my best coaching advice in the world. Take a deep breath. Imagine you're 95 years old and you're just getting ready to die. You're on that deathbed. You're given a beautiful gift, the ability to go back in time and talk to the person that's listening to me right now. What advice would the wise 95-year-old you who knows what really mattered in life and what didn't, what was important and what wasn't, what advice would that wise old person have for the you that's listening to me right now? You don't have to say anything or do anything or write anything. Just answer that question in your mind. What advice would that old person have for you? Whatever you're thinking now, do that. In terms of performance appraisal, that's the only one that's going to matter. If that old person says you did the right thing you did, the old person says you made a mistake, you did. You don't have to impress anyone else. Some friends of mine interviewed old folks who were dying and got to ask this question. What advice would you have? On the personal side, three themes. Theme number one, three words, be happy now. Be happy now. The great Western disease, I will be happy when, when I get the money status, BMW, condominium. India has become totally infected with this disease. I will be happy when. We all have the same when. That old person is when. 
many of the people listening to me right now, you're among the luckiest people that ever lived. Many of you are smart, educated, interesting work, have friends, family. Compared to me, you have you. You have it all. Don't get so wrapped up chasing what you do not have. You cannot see what you do have. Learning point number two, friends and family. As I said earlier, never get so anxious to climb that ladder of success that you forget the people who love you. When you're 95 years old and you look around the deathbed, they're the only people there. Final advice, if you have a dream, go for it. If you don't when you're 35, you probably won't when you're 85. Business advice isn't much different. Number one, have fun, life is short. Number two, do whatever you can do to help people. The main reason to help people has nothing to do with money or status or getting ahead. The main reason to help people is much deeper. The 95 year old you will be very proud of you because you did and very disappointed if you do not. If you do not believe this is true, ask any CEO who has retired. I've asked very many a question. What are you proud of? None told me how big their office was. All they've ever talked about is the people they helped. Final advice is also the same, go for it. Your worlds are changing, your industries are changing. Do what you think is right. You may not win, at least you tried. Old people, we almost never regret the risk we take and fail. We always regret the risk we failed to take. And finally, it's my honor to talk to all of you. Hope you found our time together to be practical and useful. And again, my goal is to try to help you have maybe just a little better life and maybe you can help some other people do the same. So thank you very much for this kind invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, uh, very much uh, for actually taking out your time and giving these profound nuggets of, of wisdom. Uh, thank you so much. And Piyush, uh, thank you from our side. And Piyush, you would want to. Yeah. So, yep. So, what an exciting discussion and exciting nuggets and uh, excellent nuggets for sure. So, I would say, Marshall, everyone has their own ways of expression, and I believe we all have a lot to say, but finding ways to say it is more than half the battle. And I am kind of reminded of the quote that the hardest arithmetic to master is that which enables us to count our blessings. And I'm trying to decode this phenomena. We've had an unprecedented turnout. I guess it has been such a stupendously engaging session that in a kind of stillness, each one of us is almost speechless. So on behalf of the Ashang Desai Center for Leadership and Organization Development, it is a pleasure for me to thank you all, first and foremost, to the young leaders out there. Thank you very much for turning in. I hope you had a great time. And in conversation with Marshall today were, of course, our star professors, Professor Keeti Sharda and Professor Vishal Gupta. Thank you. And we were privileged to have with us today the inimitable Marshall Goldsmith. Thank you, Marshall. You rock. My personal thank you on two accounts to you. One, for agreeing to speak at the Ashang Desai Center for Leadership. I am Ahmedabad. And second, for helping coach me yesterday with a personalized one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to remember it for a long, long time. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you so much for this wonderful session.